unmanned aerial vehicles, commonly known as drones, are already a multi-billion dollar industry. Originally developed for the military, they're quickly being adapted for commercial and recreational uses. Everything from monitoring the weather to battling wildfires. But things are changing so quickly that regulations remain vague. Join us as two Central Florida experts discuss the prospects and perils of drones, next on Metro Center Outlook. It may surprise you to learn that drones are flying across Central Florida on a regular basis. Our first guest is Dr. Brent Terwilliger. He chairs the Master of Science program in Unmanned Systems at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Dr. Terwilliger, welcome to the show. Thank you. What is a UAV? So a UAS or UAV is a remotely operated aircraft where the pilot actually is not on board the aircraft. So you say UAS is an unmanned aerial system versus an unmanned aerial vehicle, so either way. Correct, the term UAV, it's a historic term now. Uh, it's, it's been used primarily in military designations uh, and really since uh, the mid 2000s, we've seen the development of the term or concept of unmanned aircraft system, where it's a system of systems. It's a uh, bunch of highly complex and organized components that work together to achieve the mission function. So this is not just necessarily a new concept. There's a historical con context here, and we've improved on technology is what you're saying. Absolutely. In fact, unmanned aircraft technology predates manned aviation. We use this technology, or not us, but our predecessors in aeronautics, uh, the Wright brothers, Elmer Sperry, a, a litany of folks that helped to push this uh, technology in the early 1900s, they used this technology as test beds. So they proved the concepts that flight would work, powered flight, and they learned from uh, the use of this technology to actually make manned flight achievable. Over time, there were perceived benefits that could be uh, derived from the adaptation of this technology, primarily for military application at first. Uh, over time, we saw that evolve into some of the research uh, platforms, and then now here we are on the, the verge of uh, commercial unmanned aviation. Well, how much research then is going on currently in this field? Quite a bit. This is a substantial research focus right now. We have uh, government agencies are pursuing research, you know, from uh, things like DARPA uh, through to the FAA. We also have universities and commercial sector are per, uh, pursuing research in this avenue. And I know that UAVs, and that's how I refer to them, or is it, is it synonymous with a drone? It can is. I use that terminology? Yeah, you can, so we've, we've come to accept the term drone in our, in our uh, vernacular, because I mean, it has been popularized. Originally, there was a little bit of pushback on that, because there is a militarized connection with that. Drones uh, were used in the military for a specific function, uh, aerial defense testing and aerial targetry training. Over time, we've, we've uh, come to see this term used more and more f uh, to reflect more uh, small systems, multi-rotor, uh, consumer-type systems. But really, it does reflect the, all the same thing. Well, I mean, they can come in all different sizes and weights as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And where, where we are right now is we see a, a significant push for the development of small UAS. That would be systems under 55 pounds. That's where a lot of the uh, experts are, are indicating the substantial growth. We've seen it in the FAA's uh, announcements uh, where they, they're expecting a tremendous amount of UAS in the national airspace. Uh, 2.5 million this year uh, and upwards growth uh, exceeding 10 million, I believe, in, uh, uh, by 2020. It's amazing. What about the nanotechnology aspect? Is, th is that part of the research as well? So it is. It, it's really being... Uh, pursued at the, for the underlying technology. So That's a whole different wealth of, of applications for that. Absolutely, we see that in uh, things like the battery production. And batteries are one of, the, one of the biggest constraints of this technology. Right now, a small system gets about 15 minutes, 25 minutes of operational flight. 
if we can increase the capacity and performance of batteries, we could expect to get hours out of this, if not more than that. We've seen some technology uh, where they, they couple uh, energy transmission, such as lasers or, or RF, uh, to be able to recharge the aircraft in flight. That gives us the capability for potentially uh, a long duration sustainable missions, uh, more than days, but maybe even months and right. years. You've talked about the incredible growth here. What about this as an economic driver? Are there jobs available, salary ranges? What's, what's happening here? Absolutely, there, there are right now substantial opportunities out there. Uh, you know, we've seen, if you do a, a, just a casual search right now online for available positions associated with unmanned systems, there are thousands of positions available. Uh, we're starting to see some growth here in Florida. We can expect to see some locally uh, through modeling and simulation. You know, some of the reports coming out of uh, the experts in the field are by 2035, a substantial portion of the DOD, Department of Defense, uh, vehicle fleet will be unmanned or optionally piloted. That means we need to have a shift in the modeling and simulation to train for that, to incorporate those models into uh, their tools so that we can uh, start to realize the benefit of, of the technology a little more. What are the general categories or the sectors for drones? So that really depends on the user. Within the DOD, they use a, a tiered uh, classification method where they'll have group one uh, through to five, and that's based on performance uh, of the system. So if it's uh, you know 20 pounds or less and flies at certain altitudes and air speeds, it would be a group one. And they, they rank that based on that. In the commercial or civil side of things, uh, we are working right now to define that. We do have one clear definition, that's small UAS. That would be anything under 55 pounds that flies under uh, 100 miles per hour. We are starting to see the emergence of a new category, which, which is called micro. That would be under 4.4 pounds. There is an effort underway right now, uh, with the FAA leading it, to define what exactly is a micro. It's, it looks like it's not gonna be weight-based, but performance-based. So they're gonna work with experts in the field, they're gonna work with industry to define what constitutes that. And then what we expect to see is a little more accommodation in operation. Uh, you're not gonna have so many tightly constrained rules for operation of those systems. Let's talk about the performance applications then. I was absolutely amazed at the diversity of th applications already in use. What are some of them? Well, so some of the uses we see are search and rescue in support of public services. Uh, we see urban planners using them to uh, survey areas and, and put together uh, models of what that terrain looks like uh, using orthographic imagery. Uh, we've also seen uh, the discussion of cargo. That is actually quite exciting. Uh, we have quite a bit of uh, technology development going in that realm, including on the safety side uh, with detect, sense, and avoid. Uh, being supported through uh, the FAA and, and many of their research uh, pursuits. So there, there's a whole litany of possible uses of this technology. And what I constantly see in my classroom, uh, my students talk about these, they present new ideas. We see just a, a, a explosive growth of opportunity to utilize this technology and help us realize efficiency gains in what we do. I was reading about the use in agriculture for pest control, and one article was talking about natural disasters, you know, with a nuclear uh, reactor breaking apart, then to send that in instead of a person. It's just amazing that we can use applications like this. Absolutely. This technology, it helps us with applications that are dull, dirty, or dangerous, uh, often referred to as the three Ds. You know, it's it, capability. The three Ds. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I read a little bit about potential applications as well. Amazon was talking about delivering packages to your doorstep by a drone. Is that realistic? It, it is. Uh, so we have some, some technology to, to develop. We have some procedures that need to be put in place and we need to work uh, with the regulatory arms to make sure that it's uh, gonna be safe. And that's, that's the, probably the biggest single uh, challenge to us right now is ensuring safety with this technology. We're talking mainly here about commercial applications. Some of them have been pretty straightforward. Some of them are a little bit more controversial and, and gray areas like that. What, can you give us an example of one of those? So anything really that deals with 
personal privacy. That has been one of the biggest pushbacks from the public is uh, ensuring protection of their privacy. So there are there are uh, numerous state laws uh, across the U.S. that are being developed or already implemented to protect the personal privacy of citizens. Uh, we also see national policy uh, that's working to ensure privacy is protected. That is, in my mind, probably one of the most substantial uh, gray areas. The other is just uh, the perception of, of what is legal. What can this technology be used for? How do I, as a either a recreational pilot or as a uh, commercial uh, operator, what do I need to do to ensure that I'm compliant with the laws and the, the regulations that are out there? There, there's been a push by the FAA and as well as industry partners uh, to help educate the public through Know Before You Fly, uh, as well as uh, universities and, and others uh, in the uh, you know, education sector are pushing for uh, uh, public outreach. Uh, Embry-Riddle, we actually led a UAS uh, massively online open course, or MOOC, in January with more than 5,000 participants. How do you see this technology for the future? I see it as exciting. There's a lot of opportunity here. As I mentioned before, we can realize efficiency uh, gains in what we do with this technology. We just have to use it in a responsible manner. So we have to be aware of what those regulations are, how I can use it, where I can use it, and under what circumstances. Uh, I, I'm extremely excited for my students as well as for everybody that's coming up in this field, all the stakeholders, because there is substantial opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you. When we return, we'll examine the legal aspects of the drone revolution. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Joining us now is Timothy Ravitch. He's an attorney and assistant professor in legal studies at UCF. He's also one of only 37 lawyers in the state of Florida who is a board certified specialist in aviation law. Professor Ravitch, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. You are an attorney and a licensed pilot for drones. Yes. What are some of the areas of concern with UAVs? So it runs the gamut from the practical to the legal. Uh, the practical side of this is sometimes you have uh, bad people doing uh, bad things with good products, right? Using uh, something as uh, uh, innocuous as a drone or a, a recreational uh, machine uh, for bad purposes, right? Spying on people and so forth. From a legal perspective, it runs the gamut, as I say. Uh, it uh, in, uh, includes the First Amendment, for example, uh, right of uh, speech, right, journalism uh, using drones. The Second Amendment, the right to arm, right, you could weaponize uh, a drone or an oh, unmanned aerial vehicle. Uh, the Fourth Amendment, uh, search and seizure. The Fifth Amendment, our right to life, liberty, and property. The Tenth Amendment, what the federal government can't do, the states can do, but we don't know uh, where that balance uh, lies. National security, criminal law, tort law, insurance uh, law. So we've uh, got a, a huge lot menu. to cover. Yes. A lot to cover. <laughs> Let's talk specifically about the privacy issues. How does a UAV threaten the privacy of an individual? And I think that ties in with the Fourth Amendment. Yeah, it may tie into the Fourth Amendment. So, um, so drones don't necessarily invade privacy. People do. Uh, I know that sounds like sort of an NRA type of uh, uh, mantra or, or motto. But the idea is that uh, drones are about information, right? They're about intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance. And having that capability in the hands of private citizens can lead to privacy intrusions. I can fly my drone over my backyard, I'm not trespassing, and I rec can record my neighbors at the swimming pool or the children at the swimming pool. Uh, you can see where that can get very uh, uncomfortable. That's a private citizen doing that. On the other hand, the government, the federal government or local uh, law enforcement can use drones also for purposes of uh, tracking you, uh, surveilling you for uh, extended periods of time, uh, not just for an hour or two hours, but for weeks or months at a time. And that gives a lot of concern. I should also add that drones are extremely small, right? Uh, nanotechnology, they're miniaturized airplanes. Sometimes you wouldn't even know uh, that a drone is following you. 
It's not as cumbersome as, say, a big uh, journalism or news helicopter following you. Those privacy issues, then, are very real. When you say, you know, you're outside or uh, in a public place, I think there's an expectation of a certain amount of lack of privacy. But this sounds to be at a, at a, at a different level then. Yeah, you know, in, in some senses, drones are part of the Internet of Things, right? They're connected, they're wireless. Uh, and, you know, it's funny, you don't have to be outside to lose your privacy anymore. You can be in the, quote unquote, privacy of your own living room, disclosing all sorts of private facts and photographs on, say, Facebook. So privacy is undergoing a, a, quite a revolution here where I don't know where the expectation of privacy, more to the point, forget me, the law is evolving on the right to privacy. It used to be, back in the, early, the late 19th century, that the right to privacy was the right or the expectation to be let alone. Just leave me alone and I, I have a, sort of that private seclusion. The law developed in the 1920s and 30s to link privacy with property. In other words, the government didn't search you unless they physically trespassed into, say, your backyard or your home. That changed in the 60s, where the Supreme Court of the United States said, well, privacy is really not about places, it's about people. And drones, uh, we don't know where it fits uh, into that legal paradigm uh, at this particular point. Well, then how does the law concerning UAVs and privacy, how does it differ depending whether it's a public or a private entity that's using this technology? Does it differ? Uh, it does differ. We certainly uh, know uh, that military drones are allowed, uh, or at least the United States government uses that in Pakistan and Afghanistan and, and elsewhere. Law enforcement uh, is prohibited, at least here in Florida, is in fact prohibited by statute from using a drone to collect information or evidence. So it's disallowed. There are some exceptions uh, if there's a national security risk or swift action is required. Uh, but generally speaking, law enforcement are prohibited in the state of Florida and elsewhere from using it. Privately, however, you and I could petition the Federal Aviation Administration for, let's say, a license or an exemption, permission to fly our drone for, uh, for profit, uh, for aerial photography, to... A movie, uh, a, a movie. Uh, filming a movie. Absolutely. Right. Those sorts of things. Uh, farming, precision agriculture, for example. So uh, on the one hand, it's not allowed for uh, uh, government uh, use, subject to exemptions. On the private side, it is allowed, but it's still heavily regulated. Now, when you say the law enforcement in Florida, does that mean that law enforcement in other states have different laws? So it's state law and not federal? Uh, correct. Uh, it's both state and federal. Uh, under a law back in the 1940s, the United States government has what we call exclusive sovereignty over the airspace. Uh, there's good reasons for that. We want uniform laws. We don't want a pilot to have to think about the airspace over Florida and then it's something different over Texas. <laughs> right? Yeah. That, that would uh, make no sense. Uh, and in fact, in the 50s, there were some very bad accidents, including in a military plane that crashed on a, a high school yard and, and killed children where the government, Congress specifically said, enough is enough, we need to make uniform air safety. In drones, we're uh, not there uh, yet. Individual states are having to fill the void in the absence of federal regulators coming forth with uh, definite regulations. And, and that's not a great position, I think, to be in. So do you think that, that this use of drone technology around the privacy issues, do you think that it can be successfully integrated for governmental and for commercial applications? Do you think we'll get there? Uh, uh, we'll get there as a society whether or not the law does. Uh, the law lags technology, right? Think of all of the innovations technologically that we have that the law was slow to respond to. Chlorine, x-rays, the measles vaccine, uh, heart surgery. Uh, the law didn't know how to deal with this. It had to play catch up. That's uh, fine, uh, but the law does need to catch up with this. Having said that, uh, the law, uh, lawmaking, is a lot about optimization and balance. And uh, we're going to have to find a way at the state, local, and federal level, and international level, in fact, of where people's uh, sensibilities are in terms of privacy uh, and where the law should disallow or allow certain uh, operations. Now, you talked about federal law and state law. I know the FAA has been criticized for being slow to enact uh, regulations and rules here, and states and even local governments are putting forth ordinances. Is that causing more confusion? So uh, you always want one clear voice uh, on matters of safety uh, is, is best, going back to the 1950s with the uh, Federal uh, Aviation uh, Act. 
Uh, having said that, the, the FAA deserves some defense here, which is this is a new technology. They don't have the jurisdiction or even the competency to deal with certain, uh, informa uh, certain issues, like privacy. The FAA is worried about safety, not privacy. The Department of Justice might be interested in uh, civil rights and those sorts of issues, but it's not entirely the FAA's fault for uh, uh, not being ahead of the game on this. And both are big issues. Both are big issues. So uh, now, you know, in 2016, the government's doing a better job of coordinating, uh, but I think the FAA can and probably should be doing more. The risk here is it's one thing to say, well, we lack the competency, we're doing our best to, to get ahead of the curve. Uh, it's another thing for the FAA to sort of squelch an innovation altogether. And there's a real risk here that the FAA won't allow perfectly sensible applications like search and rescue because they don't understand the technology yet. That's not a good way uh, to go in, in my and other people's view. I was reading, though, that uh, with, with the FAA, when rules and regulations are put forth, that there will be many challenges in enforcing them. So I wasn't sure if that was part of the, the reluctance to make the, the set rules. So there's nothing new here in the sense that laws are hard to enforce. Who enforces them? Uh, once you, uh, say, get a conviction or you find the, the wrongdoer and you, you penalize them, can you get compensation from them? Can you impose the penalty? That's always an issue uh, of enforcement, jurisdiction, penalties, uh, damages, et cetera. But I have to tell you, you know, Australia's had drone laws since 2002. The United Arab Emirates government uh, is putting forth laws where you can use drones to deliver uh, licenses, passports, and medicine. So it is unclear why the United States, which is a leader, certainly in the manufacture and production of drones, can't be further ahead uh, from a legal perspective. True, operating in New York uh, or Orlando might be quite different uh, than Kansas. Uh, but there sh still should be, uh, I think, a fix. And Congress, in fact, uh, mandated that the FAA have regulations in place by September 30th of 2015. That date has come and gone. Are we looking anytime soon then? Don't know. It seems to be an ad hoc piecemeal process. Uh, there's some suggestion that in May or June of 2016, the FAA will come forth with uh, more regulations. But it really is two steps forward, one step uh, back, uh, assuming we even get off our feet. In, in your opinion, should federal law prevail, or do you think, since this is really complex, do you think that a mix of federal and state are best, or does that just muddy the waters altogether? No, believe it or not, I don't think it muddies the water. Uh, I did say it's uh, better to speak with one clear voice, and on safety, I do think the federal government not only uh, can control, but has the legal authority to control under existing uh, law. What's not helpful is uh, places like Utah, or um, Utah has a, a current law proposed right now is that would allow shooting down drones. Wow. So when you have disparate laws across jurisdictions, uh, that's not a great way to go. Um, the famous Justice Brandeis of the United States Supreme Court once said that each state in the union is sort of like a laboratory for democracy. So we like the idea of states coming up with their own solutions to some of our problems. But when it comes to safety, I, I do think the FAA uh, has control over that, and they should. With the issues, the safety, the privacy issues that are surrounding the UAVs, do you see this as a, a budding technology that's just developing, or something that is so significant it could change the future of aviation? So in some senses, nothing is new here. We've had drones since probably second century uh, China, if you think of a drone as an unmanned aerial vehicle, like a balloon or a kite. But I think we are talking about a revolution in aviation, or beg your pardon, in automation and information more than aviation. And there is a revolution, right? We're going to have autonomous cars and maybe autonomous uh, airplanes uh, now and in the future. And I do think that is a seismic shift, uh, certainly in the legal uh, realm and also technologically. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. That's our show for today. Join us next week when we again explore issues important to Central Florida. Thanks for watching. I'm Diane Trees.